You are now listening to The Big Data Beard. So, hey, this is Corey Minton from the Big Data Beard team, and we are at Ignite Conference in Orlando, Florida, the super humid, muggy Orlando, Florida that is this summer. And we are excited to have Dan Jevons from Shell join us. Dan, how are you doing today, bud? Doing really well. All right. So you're one of 60,000 people at this conference, and we're super excited to have you on. Tell us a little, little bit about what you do for, uh, for Shell. So I'm the general manager for data science. Um, that means I sit within our technology group. Uh, and what we do cuts right across the business. So we're looking to apply data science and everything from exploration through to our producing assets, into manufacturing, trading, uh, into retail, and, and also, importantly, into our new energies business as well. Uh, so it's a great position to be in. So Shell's just this tiny company. Yeah, we're how really, big, really How big is Shell? Because it, it blows <laughs> my mind when I, when I started reading and doing a little research, it blows my mind how big that it's, company it's is. It's absolutely crazy. I mean, I, I think, you know, uh, we are saying yesterday, I, a lot of people think of us as a massive refining company or a pro, you know, producer of oil and gas. Um, you know, we have thousands of electric charge posts, I think over 40,000 now that we run as a network. Um, we also have a retail, with a single, um, with the largest single branded retailer on the planet. So that's 44,000 stores. Wow. Um, around 70 countries and around 30 million customers every day. So, I mean, you look at any part of the enterprise and it's just massive. You yeah. Know? So you've got to, you've got to have so many, like a variety of projects you could be working on at a company that Absolutely. large, that scale. Tell us a little bit about what you're, what you're specifically doing for them and what you were, I think you were talking yeah. about the session yesterday. I'd love to dig into that. A yeah, little. of course. I mean, we've talked about a few examples of some of the things we're doing. Um, just to give a little bit of an insight, um, we talked about some of the work we're doing in Wells. So we're developing technology to support geo steering, um, which effectively allows us to uh, provide autonomous, eventually autonomous control. Uh, in the short term, it's a human in the loop system, which is going to try to support the geo steerer and give them better time in zone uh, in horizontal well drilling. So that's pretty exciting. Um, the other project that we were talking about was what we're doing in retail, which is all around machine vision. Uh, so we're applying basically a safety system where we can automatically de detect things like smoking or cars driving in the wrong direction or people loitering for extended periods of time with masked faces. These obvious indicators that are going to cause a problem at a retail store, <laughs> That's right? That's not good. Yeah. Uh, these are the sorts of things that we're developing a solution to try and help out our service champions with. But we're also doing a lot of work in predictive maintenance. Uh, it's a very obvious use case for us. We operate a very physical value chain. And so we're looking to develop algorithms that predict when stuff's going to fail and then make sure that we provide alerts uh, to the to the operators to make sure that they're able to intervene. Yeah, so it's funny you mentioned this this term and I and I, I've heard it a little bit, but I don't think I fully understand it. So you said something about human in the loop, right? Yeah. These are the human in the loop system. Yeah, explain that to me in a little bit more detail. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I, I think um, for me, we believe in in more. Um, augmented intelligence rather than necessarily truly artificial intelligence. And those are the sorts of systems that my team is kind of focused on providing. Um, I think the, the reason I, I use that term is that we, want, we see the importance of the human operator in most of these systems. In our business, it's, it's a, it's a, ultimately, we need, safety is our number one priority. We want to make sure that everybody's safe. We want to make sure that we have intelligence making those decisions. And actually, normally, still, the human is the best at making the decision. What they're not very good at is processing the vast quantities of data that you have. So, so let's take the predictive maintenance scenario. We're running something in the region of 600 tags, and we expect an operator to keep an eye on that, right? <laughs> now, <Good luck. laughs> you know, and, and then we give them a, you, you, historically, we've tried to give them a first principles model that applies to that tag and just gives them an alerting system that says this one's out of zone. Well, oh, great, but how do I get my head around the maintenance records, the 600 tags I'm supposed to watch, and also the vision feeds that are out there? And I think the opportunity for, for the, intelligence that we're creating, the AI that we're focused on, is actually to, to help him to make his life easier. So we can actually give him, say, hey, these are the 10 things you want to look at. And by the way, we think this one's trending off. Why don't you have a look at that one? And we found that 
in engaging that way, the operators actually really buy into that because they say, hey, this makes my life easier. This is something for the user. And, and, and that's the sort of thing that we're really focused on. Very cool. So machine generated data, all this data coming off of the devices is yeah. cool. That's, but I think that's something that like we've seen a lot of use cases Absolutely. for. And there's a lot of platforms out there. Yeah. But one that we, we heard you talking about and you kind of mentioned earlier was this idea of uh, computer vision, right? Yeah. Using cameras to identify yeah. things that are happening. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about computer vision projects because I think in, in, my, in our kind of learnings, that, like, like you've talked about, it, it seems to be like the most emerging sort Absolutely. of interesting area. So tell us a little bit about what your team's doing with computer vision. Well, I mean, I mean it, it came to us about a year ago and, and we sort of had this collectively as a team, this realization that, hey, look, like I said, we're such a physical company. Um, we're operating everything from refineries through to platforms, through to pipelines, through to wind farms. Yeah. And we've got, we've basically created this false setup, if you like, where people go to those things, they look at them, they watch them, they type it into a system, and then we run algorithms on that. Yeah. And, and we kind of said, well, actually, that's really dumb. Why, why would we do that? Right? <laughs> it's a, real, it's it's a, a realization that's hard to deal with, isn't it? <laughs> why don't we just put a camera there and then we can watch it? And yeah. the camera can tell us what's interesting. Right? Yeah. So this is what we started thinking about. And we, we sort of brainstormed a bit and you come out with, so many ideas. Can we monitor corrosion? What about stock levels? Can you look at, you know, pipelines? What about if we've got, I mean, we, I, I shared this with one of our executives. Say, hey, I just commissioned a company to put an ROV in the subsurface and it's going to drive over a pipeline. Maybe we could not have to watch all of that. I said, yeah, that <laughs> that's sounds, kind of the idea. That sounds like a good idea. Um, and so I think there's, you know, there's those kind of things that, that are just coming up and it's, it's everywhere. And, and that's what's really exciting. And what we've done, uh, we picked one to start. Um, we picked something that was relatively easy in terms of we're not dealing in harsh environments. We're not dealing in ruggedized devices. We can put an edge device into a retail station. It's a little bit simpler. Um, but we also have, have, focused on something that's really real and matters to the business because they've got 44,000 retail stations. They really want to be able to make them safer. So I think what we've tried to do is, is pick something, focus on something, build a minimum viable product, do it for two stations, but build the platform in such a way that actually we can get after this whole theme. Yeah. And, and it's getting really exciting, a lot of traction internally as well. So as I mentioned, because that's one of the things I think when we talk about, you know, what are challenges that people face in this idea of getting projects like this and data science running? It's the boil the ocean mentality. That's right. Like, I'll solve all the problems. Exactly. So is that why you've, you think your team's been successful? Because you've, you've kind of piloted something, proven something, yeah. use the term MVP, which I love. Yeah. Right. Is that, is that part of the key to success? Well, we've got over 100 projects running across the group, right? <laughs> so you so, have an ocean so, going. Yeah, we do have an ocean going, but but it's MVP is my biggest mantra. So the yeah. projects for us that haven't been successful, I can characterize them in two ways. One, I tried to solve the engineering problem first. Mm -hmm. Two, I lost sight of the user. And, and that, those are the two things that basically you can normally say, if it's going to go wrong, that's where it's going to go wrong. That's, that's unique. And, and so what we try and do is we try and build something in the simplest way we possibly can so before we actually solve the engineering problem. So, you know, I've been a big advocate of Alteryx and you've probably heard about them. I pushed that really hard. And, and the reason is not because it's the most technically sophisticated data technology out there. It's not. What it's great at is it allows my team to enter into a dialogue with the business and create a rapid prototype of something which we might want to then scale up. Now, in some cases, you can scale it up on Alteryx. In other cases, you might need to go to a Databricks or an SAP HANA or, you know, right. whatever else. Radio systems. Um, uh, and, and I think, but, but what's interesting is by testing very quickly, what tends to happen is you actually deliver the value before you deliver the project, which is brilliant because, awesome. because the business gets something in their hands, it's a rapid prototype. Normally you're, you're focused on one very small case anyway, yeah. and they're getting that, that value immediately. And then the sponsorship comes, the buy-in comes, and it's, you can build from that. Yeah. So one of the things I see that, that is challenging many organizations when they start to approach this computer vision idea of using video data to uh, tell us something is the challenge of video is very large. Yeah. Like video is a big file. Yeah. It's a big stream, yeah. especially if you want that yeah. granularity of high definitions yeah. where you can get really specific yeah. in your models. How in the world do you solve the problem of having 44,000 stores with multiple yeah. cameras that are getting higher and higher def? Right? How yeah. do you get all to that data back to, a, to your core data yeah. center to run models? Is that possible? So, so, so I, I love this question. So this is something I'm really passionate about. So this was the, this was the problem to solve, right? Okay. Because we did, the, we did the math on it. Effectively, six HD cameras, it's about 200 meg per second mm -hmm. that you're streaming locally. Yeah. And the question is, like you said, I mean, that's just unaffordable. There's no one. <laughs> <laughs> Unless 
yes, you, I mean, Verizon would love to sell you the bandwidth <laughs> yeah, of that. Yeah, exactly. Well, and half those gas stations are in highly rural areas oh, as well, well right? Okay. So, I don't even know if the whole city has that kind of a pipe. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we were we were trying to figure out, what do you do? And and yeah. this is where the edge story comes in. And, and this is also, to be honest, why we bought into the Azure story, because it really helped us with this. What we've actually done is we've created an intelligent filter on the edge. So we're using a, basically a thin deep learning model, right? So So thin layered, uh -huh. pushed, containerized, pushed to the edge. And effectively what we're then doing is in the cloud, we're running the, the full model, mm -hmm. right? So it's a double layered filter and we're using Kafka and Spark streaming to push the frames of interest in between those two. So that's, that's how we got around it. And that actually is the, the really clever bit about the solution. That, so, okay, so you're containerizing like tensor models or what? TensorFlow, yeah. TensorFlow model yeah. deployed on the edge on yeah. some lightweight compute? Like, That's right. Oh, okay. So you're, so you're literally, it's almost like a distributed neural network. Exactly. Oh, that's really it's that's really cool, isn't it? Yeah, that's, I didn't think of it that way. Okay, we're gonna. Okay, so is there is there any like is there any talk about that? Because clearly, this is something that shells. Yeah. you know, you guys have got. Is that something that other people can like look at? There's there's good places where you've learned this. Where would where would somebody learn more? Yeah, about that idea. We're talking about. I mean, we're trying to figure out how to do it at the moment. We we want to try and be a bit more open and and try and open source some of the stuff we're we're doing. It's it, it's a difficult one, right? Because you want there's certain things where for us, you know, we do want to keep some of it to ourselves. Sure. For sure. like like a reasons, but <laughs> but at the flip side, a lot of the things like this, they're not necessarily differentiating, and it's yeah. cool to share that back with the community and also collaborate because, you know, if we can get it out there, actually people can come up with better ways and adjust. Absolutely. So we're looking at that. It, it's it's difficult, right? Because in many ways, we're going through a digital revolution as an organization, and um, we're going through a, a period of change, and and so we're figuring out these new processes. Okay, how how do you do that as Shell? Yeah. Right, we've never open sourced anything before. <laughs> yeah, so that's interesting. So uh, you did talk about that Azure was you chose Azure because it helped simplify something. Yeah, help me understand how did Azure's something around their IoT stack? How, how did that help simplify things for Shell? Well, I mean, what I, the thing about IoT, so IoT Hub was really helped us with that containerization. So so what we did is we put in a basically CI CD pipeline using Azure DevOps uh, or yeah. VSTS as it used to be called. And we, we pushed those containers straight into IoT Hub. And that worked brilliantly because you've got the IoT Hub syncing and you've got the heartbeat to the edge, mm -hmm. which gives us, I mean, you think about building something like that, oh, it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a nightmare. nightmare. <laughs> so, you know, for, for us, this was all about acceleration, speed to value. Yeah. It solves some of those core technical problems that we now don't need to think about. So we can focus on the clever bit that actually is differentiating for us. Very cool. So I know you're talking here at Ignite, but where can people keep up with what you're doing in conferences and sessions? Like, where do you like to publish things? Yeah. Where, do you, where do you talk most? So um, I try and do quite a bit. So I'm at Spark Summit. No, next very week, cool. so I'm yeah. giving a keynote there in in Europe. So back in London, cool. um, uh, we've got a few other things. I'm I'm talking. I'm also going to the Aldrich conference, uh, and and then we're trying to do a couple of things in the new year. New year. We're pretty. We're out there. We're trying to talk about it, and we're also trying to put a lot of stuff onto our website. So onto yeah. Shell.com around the digital journey that we're going on. So you'll get more and more of that going Excellent. forwards. Well, Dan, this was super fun. I love the, the thing I took away from this. Right, that, that's a really clever bit that you've, you've solved there with the distributed model for edge processing. I'd never thought of it that way. So thank you for that. Don't worry. But I want to switch gears here because we want to have a little fun. I know we've got yeah, of course. a great conversation, but I want to switch gears to our rapid fire. We've learned a lot from our guests about big data, but now it's time to get a bit personal. In a segment we like to call Rapid Fire. Pew, pew. All right, so we've talked a little bit so far about AI and, and what you believe the future of it will be, but what year do you think Skynet will go online? <laughs> 2025. 2025. Yeah, I'm afraid of that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it tends to get closer and closer <laughs> every time we ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, what has been the last great book you've read, personal or technical? Uh, Lean Startup. I loved it. Shaped yeah. my thinking on MVP. Yeah. How, why so? I, I think um, it was like a slap in the face. Right, I just come off a project which hadn't gone so well, and and as as I was reading it, you just it's like all the hallmarks are there of the things that he's saying not to do. <laughs> Is this? Uh, are you talking about Ash Myura's uh, running lean or lean startup? Lean startup. Okay. Well, um, I'm looking that up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, it's a brilliant book. I mean, he, he literally lays out kind of how to run a project and a lot of it relates to data science. So I'd strongly recommend it. Excellent. I might have to add that to the uh, Big Data Beard the big, yeah, the, Book Club. The Book Club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, what genre of music are you listening to right now? Is there anything that helps you get focused? Um, I'm a big John Mayer fan. Really? So, yeah, I'm a guitarist. Uh, so yeah, I All right. respect. Any yeah. particular album that you really dig into more than the other ones? Um, Probably heavier things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good choice. I was Very rocking good. heavier things on the way here. Yeah, nice. Yeah, funny. Awesome. <laughs> I like his uh, John Mayer trio. Oh yeah, yeah that's the, cool. The when he did trio. Live. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's my favorite. Uh, what piece of technology is making your life worse right now? <laughs> uh, um, our enterprise authentication system is not exactly <laughs> where I want it to be right now. You're the second person that yeah. said that. <laughs> You know, I think it's just, uh, like authentication is getting easier for everything. And I think in the enterprise, because of security, it's just getting harder. Yeah, exactly. And so the two things are just difficult. Well, I saw they, they announced yesterday. Uh, friction. Yeah, right. friction. Like I, passwordless I, yeah, I world. Like, please. That would be crazy. <laughs> yeah. Passwordless. I love yeah, that. Idea. I love that. Let's get rid of them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is your biggest money pit right now? Oh, that's a good question. Um, probably we're doing some renovations on the house, so that, there's quite a bit going into yeah, that at the right. moment. Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I just sold mine, so I'm pretty stoked about <laughs> nice. not yeah. having. He was, home, he was homeless yeah. for six nice. weeks, but it was awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's all right, making it so far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you going anywhere interesting soon? So we've talked about some conferences. Any personal travel? Or? Uh, so I'm off to Houston next. Um, that's not personal. I'm going... Makes sense with Shell. Yeah. My team's <laughs> over there. So shout out to them. Yeah. Uh, so, so going over there. And then after that, just back to London for a while. Hopefully manage to try to stay put for a bit. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what show are you binging right now? Uh, Silicon Valley. Yeah, uh, buddy. Good. <laughs> uh, good choice. I have not finished the uh, last season. I haven't either. I'm like four episodes out. It's so. brilliant. It's so good. Yeah, yeah. It just yeah. gets better. It does. And, and I think, you know, in my line of work, it's... You know, well, it, it strikes it, home. It strikes home. Yeah. <laughs> it just cuts us deep, man. Because you watch this character, exactly. you're like, I know that exactly, guy. Yeah. Exactly right. Exactly right. And then the one you don't know, yeah. you are. Oh, <laughs> <Aww>, that's awful. <laughs> I haven't thought about it that way. <laughs> Sorry, TJ Miller. <laughs> oh, that's a bit of me. That's yeah. quite true. So we talked about a, a little bit that you have a blog at Shell. Yeah. Where else could we find you on social? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. So I, I, I post all my stuff on LinkedIn. I just find it's the best way for me and I, a lot of people I want to talk to are there. So it's, uh, yeah, that's Absolutely. been my choice. Well, very cool, Dan. This is a great conversation. Loved hearing what Shell's doing to advance the use of data science for such a crazy myriad of use cases. I'm really interested in hearing more and seeing you guys develop this, this IoT strategy using video at the edge. Thank you so much for joining the Big Data Beard podcast, Dan. Thank you for having me. Awesome. It was fun. Thanks for listening to the Big Data Beard podcast. The music from this episode is by Andrew Bell. Check him out on iTunes or Spotify. It would also be pretty awesome if you'd subscribe to our YouTube channel or give us a rating. It really does help. <laughs>